Do you sometimes get a funny tingling sensation that goes through your body uh, every time you hear a brand new board game is about to be released? It's kind of like a spidey sense, except this one detects cardboard. Well, I have eight games that I'm super excited about that are coming up very soon. So much so that I wanted to share it with you, my friends, my family, and the viewers. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about eight games that have piqued my interest that are coming soon. And these games might pique your interest as well. Hi, my name is Danny, I'm from Board Game Sanctuary. I'm an Australian modern board gamer from the land down under, and I'm really passionate about board gaming, and I can't wait to share this with you. Hey Danny, have you heard about that new board game? Uh, which one? You know, that new game. The one that I was telling you about. Oh, that new game. Oh man, I'm so excited for it. Hang on a minute. How did you know which new game I was talking about? It was more like in the way that you said new game. It wasn't new game, it was new game. You know me so well, but that wasn't it. Number eight on my list is a game all about colonizing another planet. And unfortunately we didn't look after the first one. So now we're gonna really start from scratch again and try and do it better the second time. In this game, players are going to be taking on the role of different clans as they excavate for water, improve their technology, all with the idea of building a colony on this new planet and doing so more efficiently than the other players. It's a card game called Expedition to 5X. Now, if you've played any 4X games, these uh, 4X games are often centered around the four main uh, actions that you would usually take, and that is to explore new territories, to expand your territory, to exploit your territory by improving the resources and improving the equipment that's there, and also to exterminate anyone else who kind of gets in your way. So there's a little bit of a flavor of military and economy all bundled into one. This game uh, adds an extra X to it, and that is to excavate, and you're uncovering uh, different uh, relics, and you're also uncovering water. As you can see, there's like a water die, which you can uh, use to feed your clan members. But there is a subtle auctioning mechanism to this game, because each and every round, there's 15 rounds in the game, I believe, you're gonna have access to all five actions. You're gonna be playing a card out, and there is a subtle auctioning uh, level to this game where if you can play your card most efficiently and outcompete your opposing clan players, you'll probably get like a bonus. Now there's not a lot of information in this game so far, and a lot of what I've told you is mainly just inferred from the information that's available, uh, but I just love the art style that this game has. It reminds me of those image comics book series where you can feel like that whilst you're playing a card driven game, you can definitely feel like you are on the planet, you're excavating and you're exploring all the resources that are there. Oh, while you're with me, would you like a coffee? I can make you one. Well, that brings me to uh, game number seven. This is a game about working at a, as a barista in a coffee shop as you race against the other players to make the best coffees and fulfill customer orders. And boy, do I like a good cuppa. And in Australia, we are all well known for being very particular about our coffee blends and the style of coffees, so much so that we are even devoted to certain local cafes because that's the type of flavor of coffee and the way we like it and that's the one that we want and that's the one we can't live without. Uh, I could go on forever about coffee in Australia. Uh, all I can say is coffee here is amazing. It's almost a culture here. Uh, but basically, Coffee Rush is a game where you're gonna be moving your little baristas across an ingredient board. You're gonna be gathering ingredients and then you're gonna be placing those ingredients in some really cute little glass coffee cups. The little uh, caveat here about this game is that you'll actually have several coffee orders that you'll be managing all at the same time and simultaneously. So the player who can gather the right combo of ingredients, fulfill those different coffee orders, and then offload them and deliver them to the customer, obviously with a smile, you'll be able to earn points. Now, there is a huge ticker timer effect to this game. And if you don't fulfill that coffee order that you get this round, all of the orders shift down and any orders at the very bottom of this list of orders, because the customer has obviously been waiting such a long time to get their high quality coffee, that coffee then becomes a penalty for you. And once a player has dropped five 
coffees off their order list that they haven't been able to fulfill, the game is over and the player who has been able to satisfy most of those orders in the most efficient time is going to be the winner of the game. And I love that uh, sense of time pressure when it comes to trying to gather every ingredient. You want to increase the value of your coffee by delivering it to your customer as quickly as possible. It adds such a great pressure cooker element to the game and a lot of these food style games often have this sense that you've got to do things quickly, efficiently and at a high level. Game number six that I'm excited about is one that has a name themed and as you can see in my house I love board games and plants. I love a game which can exploit the shape of nature and use it to create an interesting unique puzzle and as I said I love puzzles. The next game I want to talk about is Leaf. Leaf is a game where you're going to be given lots of different shaped leaves, each with different colours, and you're going to be placing them out in front of you so that the tips of the leaves connect with each other. And however many tips that you can connect to each other determines how many times you can trigger that action. And different leaves will have different actions that you can take. And the whole aim of the game is to kind of cultivate these mushrooms that grow on your leaves, acquire sets of animal colours, Cards, but also create this cool intricate victory point generating mechanism using the shapes of the leaves themselves and it kind of reminds me of a cool chilly autumn day wearing my scarf and wandering around and just picking up leaves and inspecting their shape and their color and their form and function which is great and very evocative in this game. So the different colors of leaves that you choose from are, are going to be determined by cards that you play. So you play a card which will determine which shape leaf you'll be able to take and then the color of that shape leaf will also determine the type of action you're going to take. So the green leaves are going to give you more cards in your hand, the yellow leaves are going to give you more sun uh, tokens, you've got red leaves which will give you mushrooms. Mushrooms are really important in this game because you really want to connect all the mushrooms together into a group. You can have small mushrooms and you can even upgrade them and make them much larger mushrooms which I think increases your victory point scoring value. And then you've also got brown leaves which is kind of like a racing element where you're going to be moving your little squirrels up the trunk of this tree, gathering extra bonus resources as you go. Hey Danny, I see that you're turning over a new leaf in this hobby. Well, I'm using this to decorate my plant themed board game shelf. So, I guess I am. One of my favorite things to do is to look after my fantails. They are definitely a strong part of my life. And so naturally I'm drawn to a theme which is centered around fish and preserving fish and looking after and cultivating schools of fish so that they can thrive and grow. Hidden Ark is a board game that simply does that. What I love about Hidden Ark is the fact that you are scouring the different oceans across the world in your little vessels or using your armada of boats and then you're kind of trying to collect these species and preserve them for the future. I love how the game actually works and you're actually going to be building little stations across uh, the board itself and different outposts where you're going to be deploying your ships and then there'll be different fish species that will appear on the map that you'll need to go over, satisfy their conditions and then collect them. Each and every round there are going to be opportunity tokens that are going to be laid out for players to draft. The opportunity tokens then get picked up and they get placed onto your board and each board has different rows that you can trigger and activate each and every time and based on whichever row you choose all of those actions on that row are going to trigger so it might be moving your ships it might be uh, building a second ship it might be building a research station i think this game also invites for some really cool geographical movement mechanisms where you're trying to think about okay there's that particular species up in the corner of the board or there's a species over here in Asia that I need to access. Where's the best place to build my research station? Where's the place to deploy my vessel and how am I going to get my vessel there before other players also get there? So you've kind of got all these like little spawning points where everyone's kind of moving their vessels, they're racing to get the different species and depending on how efficiently you've built up your action rows using these opportunity tokens because as you get more opportunity tokens your actions are going to become more and more longer, kind of reminiscent of uh, the rows in Wingspan, where every time you trigger a particular row, you get to use those actions multiple times. This kind of uh, has the same effect, except it's powering your actions on this map. 
I just love this conservation theme. Any game that can kind of encapsulate the idea of building an engine, exploring, expanding your research, just really speaks so close to me. You know, I studied microbiology at school and science at school. And this is just something that I really am passionate about. And when games can evoke that message so strongly and clearly, and especially the, the cool, artistic level that this game presents in terms of the way the fish have been illustrated it almost looks like it has come out of a biology book. The next game on this list is one that I've that's been on my radar for a long time. Ever since I first saw the box cover I was definitely sold on it. Basically this is a game that features, you probably predicted it, a plant on the cover. The game is called Bonsai where players are going to be growing their own bonsai, they're going to be cultivating and try and make uh, these bonsais look as lush and as beautiful as possible. And bonsais are basically really tiny trees in a small pot. And in this game, you're going to be starting with a bonsai pot. You're then going to be adding drafting cards. You're going to be adding tool cards to the left of your pot and plant uh, bonsai plant cards on the right of your pot. But what's really intriguing about this game is that in this game, you're going to be getting little hex tiles and the hex tiles are going to be different colored. You've got brown hex tiles, which are kind of like the branches of your bonsai tree. The green hex tiles are like the leaves. You've got the pink blossoms and then you've also got the yellow flowers. And so basically what you're doing is as you collect these bonsai hex tiles, you're connecting them together to your pot to build this most luscious bonsai tree possible. It's going to look really architectural and it's going to satisfy a whole range of different public objectives as well as um, unique objectives and bonus objectives that appear uh, throughout each and every game. So one objective might be have lots of flowers in your bonsai tree. The little trick about this game is that there's a puzzly element to building your bonsai. The brown tiles can only connect with other brown branch tiles. The leaf uh, tiles can only connect to brown branch tiles and other leaf tiles. And you've got pink flower tiles that can only connect to only the other leaf tiles. So you've got this idea that these tiles have certain placement requirements and connection requirements, but the shape of your bonsai is gonna be completely up to you. And I love this idea that you can have such a creative control over how your plant evolves, how it grows, and then trying to make that plant satisfy these extra conditions means that you can kind of still feel like you have that creative freedom whilst you've got this constrainment of the game's parameters itself. The next game I want to talk to you about is a game set in 221 BC, around about the time when the Great Wall of China was being built. It's a re-implemented version of another game with the same name, and it's called Zhang Go, The First Empire. Basically, it is a card-driven game, kind of reminds me of Dune Imperium actually, where the cards that you have in your hand are going to determine the sort of actions you're going to take for the round. Now, what's going to happen here is that you're going to always have six cards in your hand and there are three different types of decks that you'll be drawing from each and every round. You'll be then choosing your card and then deciding whether to place it on your player board or onto the main game board. Now if you place it onto your player board you get to use it to trigger certain action effects that you've kind of cultivated throughout the game and there's different slots on your board where you can tuck these cards under a maximum of three per slot I think and then you can trigger these actions and I think in the original game they were called unification action effects so here you're deciding whether the benefit for your game strategy is based on triggering what you can do on your own play board or using the six different locations out on the map. Now if you're using your card on the main game board, you're basically using that card to take that location's effect. And it might be contributing or building a part of the Great Wall of China, it might be building a palace or hiring extra workers. The actions that kind of take place on the main game board are probably not as effective as the ones that are built more uniquely on your player board. Now, what's really interesting about this game is that all the cards are numbered, and that's why they're divided into three sets. Each card has a number on it, and depending on the area's requirements and the card number played, if your number is higher than a previously played card or lower than a previously played card, you can get additional benefits and bonuses from that region or from that area. 
And that's a cool use of card synergy that I haven't seen a lot in other games before. Game number two on my list is quite mysterious. In fact, there's not a lot of information out there about this game. And the reason why it's high on my list is because of some of the other games that have come before it. Now, Devi Games is a interesting publishing company that often tries to do Euro games with very unique themes. And one of my favorite games from them is called The Red Cathedral, a small box game, which kind of was all about building the uh, Red Cathedral. And then there's this whole little area control mechanism where you're trying to um, contribute to the most columns and vie for dominance there. And there's really cool rondelle mechanism with dice that move around. That game, as soon as they said there was gonna be a spin-off version of that game set in Japan called The White Castle, I was immediately intrigued. And I've loved a lot of Devi's other Japanese-inspired games like Botoku and Bamboo. So I just thought, this is a game that I just wanna know more about. And if I can get some photos, or if you know where I can get more information, I would love to hear from you. But based on the information that I do know, I believe that kind of got a worker placement element where there's actions that you can take within your castle. And then you've got about three bridges that lead out of your white castle where you need to fortify those three bridges by deploying soldiers. And on those three bridges, you're gonna be placing dice. And obviously the dice are gonna do something which I actually don't know what they do, but that's just little snippets that I've heard Heard about. Now within your actual palace itself, you could tend it to the gardens and the koi ponds and make the place look beautiful. You could also improve your social status within the palace itself by uh, attending social functions in special rooms. And you can also invest in your military so that you can fortify and stop your castle from being attacked uh, in the future. The and now my number one most anticipated board game for this year is Barcelona. Barcelona is a Euro game. Surprise, surprise, another Euro game on my list. But this Euro game has some interesting woven intricacies that have just really connected and fired off some synapses in my brain. I looked at the rule book, I read it through and I thought, do you know what? This game is interesting. It has layers of puzzles that I haven't seen before in other Euros. Now, I love city building games, first of all. I just love Quadropolis, Suburbia, even Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which is not a city building, but it might as well be. I love Euros that can kind of give you that feeling that you're building up uh, cities or pathways, and this game does so, but at a very interesting level. Now, the way I'm going to describe the game is actually going to sound super simple. Basically going to be placing two citizens onto an intersection onto the main game board. And then based on where those citizens are placed, you're going to be able to trigger actions that are in the line of sight along the streets from where those where those citizens are actually positioned. So from each street, you'll be able to see a action tile directly vertically from where they're standing. You'll also be able to see some other, uh, other action tiles or bonuses horizontally from where they're standing. And at certain points of this board, you're gonna be able to also see things diagonally as well. So the view of the city or the view of the street is actually gonna determine what actions you're gonna be able to take. And that is just the beginning of how juicy this game is gonna get. The next part of this game is actually removing those citizens off that intersection and then building a building. And there's different levels of buildings you can build on these blueprints that are out on the game board. You can build corner buildings, you can build level one buildings, level two and level three. The level two buildings can sit on top of the level ones, so the level threes can stack across the level two. And each of the levels of the buildings are kind of representative of the different classes in Barcelona at that time. And I think this game is all about moving from the old city into this grandiose new city and starting a new life and decorating and making the streets of the city feel unique rather than have kind of like a McDonald's style uh, city where every building is the same. Here you're trying to make these buildings feel as distinct and as characteristic as possible. The other thing I really like about this game is that you can build roads, you can build narrow streets and you can build wide streets. And every time you lay out roads, you want to connect them together, kind of like building the longest road in Catan. But every time you extend your road, you're going to be earning more points based on the current length of the road in addition to what you just placed. 
you are then also going to be operating a tram. The tram is going to move around the board and the tram is going to drop off more citizens at different intersections that you potentially want to visit because each intersection has a different perspective based on the point of view and the view down the road to the different actions on the top of the board and on the side of the board, which is going to give you uh, kind of like an engine building element to the game. I also like the fact that you can lay down cobblestones and there's this separate sideboard which is representative of like the, the footpath in Barcelona and as you place your pretty cobblestones down and attach them to this communal um, section of the game, you're actually going to get extra bonuses and so it feels really thematic. You're building the roads, you're implementing these transport systems, you're building public housing, you're building parks and residential buildings for the different classes, you're even decorating them and then at the end of the round you're going to be checking to see if those citizens fill up these different tracks at the bottom of the border. Based on how they fill up, they're going to determine different types of scoring opportunities that are, going to, that are going to happen. Now, what I love also in this game is the fact that you can also own different intersections. So yes, there are intersections that are going to be more advantageous than others. And if you build and claim that intersection first, other players who place their citizens in your intersection are going to trigger bonuses and further actions that you can take based on what you've uncovered on your player board. And so you can start to see that this game of Barcelona is incredibly laid and incredibly connected. The idea of building streets, building buildings, building a city, decorating it, add, adding these footpaths and also laying them all out and connecting it all together just makes for such an interesting interconnected interlocking dot to dot puzzle that I cannot wait to play. So there you have it, my top eight games I'm super excited for. Some of these games I've already pre-ordered with my local friendly local game store just because I just know they're themes of games that I definitely want to see in my collection. Whether the games are good, well that's just probably a chance I'm going to have to take. But I'm just so excited to be able to unlock these games and share them with my friends and family. And hopefully I can feature some more of these games in more detail uh, with you in the future. Now if you found these games super exciting, please let me know what games you are excited for and looking forward to. And I know if you're watching this video beyond 2023, please let me know what games are on your radar right now and whether you've played these games that I've just mentioned and now in hindsight thinking, mm, maybe that game wasn't as good as I thought it was. Please let me know in the comment section below. And if you really enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my channel, liking this video and checking out some of the other videos on my YouTube page. Now, if you're interested in some of the other anticipated games I've talked about in the past, please head over to my page and check those out. Otherwise, this is Danny Sanya. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.